Calling all premium clients. Salvagene unveils strategy for transition to the next generation of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Also for premium clients, a new system for monitoring epigenetic changes triggered by vaccines. It could happen at any time that the COVID-19 vaccines currently available no longer trigger an adequate immune response to new mutations. That is why research continues at full speed around the world to develop second-generation vaccines. As in 2020, with the first vaccine generation, we at Salvagene have excellent connections to the teams working on the leading projects. Essentially, we have entered into a completely new phase of SARS-CoV-2, as the variants in circulation bear only limited resemblance to the original Wuhan virus. And when the first booster vaccines arrive in autumn, they will have very little in common with those that were introduced worldwide at the beginning of this year. Our core task is to develop an individual transition strategy as part of the close monitoring we carry out for all premium clients. This involves ascertaining overall immune response as well as immunity specifically conferred by vaccination. We gauge immunity levels regularly by means of SARS-CoV-2 antibody profile monitoring with two objectives in mind. Firstly, to determine the optimal timing of vaccination when we are satisfied that this is the way forward. And secondly, the degree of vaccine compatibility as and when an effective one becomes available. We have acquired a considerable body of knowledge in this area from experience with vector-based vaccines. In 32 different countries around the world, including several in Europe, the situation is such that several hundreds of thousands of people have had a first dose of the AstraZeneca vector-based vaccine, and the second dose has then been withheld. A decision now has to be taken on the administration of the follow-up jab, which is necessary to provide full immune protection. A consensus is beginning to emerge that this booster jab should be one of the mRNA-based vaccines. However, some valid reservations have been expressed, because it is now clear that there can be increased side effects. And this is precisely the sort of situation that our recommendations have fortunately adverted for our premium clients. We intend to carry on recommending what we see as the right course of action as the new generation of vaccines reach approval stage. If we take a specific and detailed look at the direction in which the virus is heading, we can say with certainty that it will continue to mutate. As the virus evolves, variants will emerge that will be increasingly successful in circumventing the immunity conferred by vaccines, i.e. viruses against which vaccination provides little or no protection. We are in contact with Jesse Goodman, formerly chief scientist at the FDA and currently working at Georgetown University, USA. Like us, he is also a member of COVAX, an organization which provides independent assessments on the vaccines used to tackle this pandemic. Spurred on by virus variants that are cropping up in parallel all over the world and for which the vaccines are already proving less effective, almost all vaccine manufacturers have now set up clinical trials with successor products. These clinical trials, unlike those conducted last year, are being made relatively public. Updates of their current ideas are being tested so that future variants cannot trick the vaccine. As was the case a year ago, speed is of the essence here because so-called vaccine breakthrough viruses are already in circulation, showing how quickly this virus can adapt to the vaccine. We have frequently reported on the main variants. In addition to the familiar B.1.1.7, B.1.3.51 and P1, we now have the P3 variant from the Philippines as well as the B.1525 variant that first appeared in the UK and West Africa, and the US variant B.1.526. We classified these variants as a matter of concern rather than a matter of interest long before the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the USA came to the same conclusion. Essentially, it has to be borne in mind that the observation of variants only produces a snapshot. With each new infection, the virus evolves. In the UK, we suddenly had the E484K mutation on the B.1.1.7, an amino acid swap at the receptor binding site, which was already known to us from the other variants, especially the South African. We reported on this in January. And the latest news is that SARS-CoV-2 is evolving fast, much faster than was thought a year ago, when it was suggested that SARS-CoV-2 mutates much less than the influenza viruses. Back in June 2020, we already challenged this assertion, predicting that the pandemic would only gain full momentum one year later, i.e. where we are now. 
The good news is that examination of the critical mutations shows the changes are always the same, appearing simultaneously at a few apparently critical sites in the viral RNA. This is cause for optimism, because if typical escape mutations such as E484K are incorporated into vaccines, vaccinated persons will also develop antibodies that can take on the mutants. Antibodies attach themselves to the viruses from the outside, and if they cover a region that the virus needs, for example, to dock with a cell, the virus no longer poses a threat. For this to happen, however, the antibodies have to fit the virus surface well, in the same way that a cake mold is a precise fit for a cake. If the shape of the cake changes, the mold is no longer a tight fit, and the virus is able to evade the antibodies. These so-called vaccine breakthroughs have two causes. One is changes to the regions of the virus that make contact with the receptors of their host cells, and the other is changes at the amino terminal end. If the antibodies specialize in these docking sites, they can effectively neutralize the viruses. The two regions are located on the spike protein of the virus, and their genetic codes are contained in the vaccines used to date, albeit in a now obsolete, unmutated form. This means that the vaccine antibodies and the new viruses are no longer such a perfect fit for each other. This was also the reason why we delayed making individual recommendations for our premium clients last winter, waiting for the perfect moment when updated versions of vaccines would come on stream. BioNTech and also Moderna have already embarked on trials, and we have had partial sight of their results. Variant vaccines are being tested here. Both development teams are using the protein blueprint of the South African variant. The first laboratory data have been very promising. Individuals who had survived an infection with the B.1.351 variant produced antibodies that were also effective against the other escape mutants currently circulating. In this context, we at Salvagene have devised our own virus displacement pyramid, in which we track which virus variant displaces another. We have already quoted the example of B.1.1.7, which was first identified in the UK. Regular readers of our keynotes know that we have pinned our hopes not only on the two mRNA vaccines already in use, namely BioNTech and Moderna, but also on the one from CureVac, which is on the point of receiving approval. CureVac is the second German company to have developed an mRNA vaccine. Studies are taking place in Europe, and especially in the UK, because the drug approval authorities are pursuing two different strategies. The FDA, which has recently reasserted its independence, demands relatively elaborate studies from the manufacturers, while the British government will much more readily grant fast and uncomplicated emergency approval for new vaccine concepts. CureVac does not use the individual virus variants that are circulating now, and may soon become obsolete, as a template, but rather identifies the most important evolutionary trends and combines them in the vaccine. If it works, this vaccine will then also protect against the variants of concern for the year 2022. In the best-case scenario, the developers will even succeed in triggering a fundamentally mutation-resistant immune response. That would then be the vaccine that ends the pandemic. However, the idea has a catch. mRNA vaccines require deep-freeze logistics that the world's poorer countries do not have so mutants could continue to emerge here that get to know the super vaccine through contact with travelers and learn how to evade it, after all. In parallel with the advances being made by CureVac, another excellent alternative for the future is being developed at the University of Austin in Texas. The team there are working on a project to enhance vaccine immunity. To this end, they want to produce a vaccine based on the embryonated hen's egg technique that has been used for flu vaccines up to now. The NDV-HXP-S vaccine will contain a genetically modified corona spike protein together with an inactivated carrier virus. At this point, it must be mentioned that the name spike protein is misleading because it sounds like it is rigid. The problem is that these proteins are actually metastable. They flap about and flex. This level of mobility works in their favor because if there is a retraction of that part of the protein to which an antibody could have bound, the virus escapes the immune defense. This is a real advantage for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The immune system keeps a close eye on which antibodies bind well and which need to move on and adjust production accordingly. It follows that the immune defense as a whole is not as good as it could be. Because of this deformable protein, fewer well-fitting antibodies are produced. Attempts are already being made with the current generation of vaccines to solve the problem by introducing an amino acid, specifically proline, at two sites. This works like a kind of molecular staple to reinforce the proteins used. 
Incidentally, we have found out that a spike protein with a total of six stiffeners, scientific name HEXA-PRO-S, increases the effects on the immune system tenfold. It is also more stable in other respects and can survive periods without cooling to some extent. Whether the larger quantity of antibodies also works on mutated viruses remains to be seen. One of the many current study sites is in Brazil, deep in the heart of virus-mutant country. Whatever the Mark II vaccines look like, the biggest challenge of this pandemic remains to get them into people's arms as quickly as possible. Some research institutes in the USA have made projections in this regard. Who will be the ultimate winner in the race between speed of mutation and adaptation of vaccines? Assuming the continuation after vaccination of social distancing, the use of face coverings, testing, and various other measures that restrict the virus's scope for mutation, then a single booster shot per year would be enough for all people on the entire globe for about two to three years. Unfortunately, the chances of achieving this are close to zero, and we can therefore predict with some confidence that the virus will continue to stay ahead of the vaccine developers, and that something completely new will emerge. We share the misgivings expressed by some experts that this could become the basis for a super mutant. In addition to the previous players and the work being done at the University of Austin, we will be monitoring the ICOSOVAX project, which also has an excellent product to offer in the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, Mark II. We are working on the assumption that vaccination will speed up the epigenetic changes in key protection and risk genes, and that the pace of acetylation and methylation processes will pick up. We will be looking at the health consequences for our salvaging premium clients of vaccination, and, in the course of time, booster jabs. To this end, we have yet again significantly expanded our epigenetic testing module, and this will become automatically available for all premium clients from next month.